Book 2, Chapter 28 Perfect Knowledge Cannot Be Attained in the Present Life Many Questions Must Be Submissively Left in the Hands of God Having therefore the truth itself as our rule and the testimony concerning God set clearly before us, we ought not, by running after numerous and diverse answers to questions, to cast away the firm and true knowledge of God. But it is much more suitable that we, directing our inquiries after this fashion, should exercise ourselves in the investigation of the mystery and administration of the living God, and should increase in the love of him who has done and still does so great things for us, and never should fall from the belief by which it is most clearly proclaimed that this being alone is truly God and Father who both formed this world, fashioned man, and bestowed the faculty of increase on his own creation, and called him upward from lesser things to those greater things which are in his own presence, just as he brings an infant which has been conceived in the womb into the light of the sun and lays up wheat in the barn after he has given its strength on the stalk. But it is one and the same Creator who both fashioned the womb and created the sun, and one and the same Lord who both reared the stalk of grain, increased and multiplied the wheat, and prepared the barn. If, however, we cannot discover explanations of all those things in Scripture which are made the subject of investigation, yet let us not on that account seek after any other God besides him who really exists. For this is the very greatest impiety. We should leave things of that nature to God who created us, being most properly assured that Scriptures are indeed perfect, since they were spoken by the Word of God and His Spirit, but we, inasmuch as we are inferior to, and latter in existence than, the word of God and his spirit, are on that very account destitute of the knowledge of his mysteries. And there is no cause for wonder if this is the case with us as respect things spiritual and heavenly, and such as require to be made known to us by revelation, since many even of those things which lie at our very feet, I mean such as belong to this world which we handle and see, and are in close contact with, transcend our knowledge, so that even these we must leave to God, for it is fitting that he should excel all in knowledge. For how stands the case, for instance, if we endeavor to explain the cause of the rising of the Nile, we may say a great deal, plausible and otherwise, in the subject, but what is true, sure, and incontrovertible regarding it belongs only to God. Then again, the dwelling place of birds, of those I mean which come to us in spring but fly away again on the approach of autumn, though it is a matter connected with this world, escapes our knowledge. What explanation again can we give to the ebb and flow of the ocean? although everyone admits there must be a certain cause for these phenomenon, Or what can we say as to the nature of those things which lie beyond it? What moreover can we say as to the formation of rain, lightning, thunder, gathering of clouds, vapors, bursting forth of winds, and such likes, or as to the storehouses of snow, hail, and other like things? What do we know respecting the conditions requisite for the preparation of clouds? Or what is the real nature of the vapors in the sky? What as to the reason why the moon waxes and wanes, and what is to the cause of the difference of nature among various waters, metals, stones, and such like things, and on all these points we may indeed say a great deal while we search into their causes, but God alone who made them can declare the truth regarding them. If, therefore, even with respect to creation, there are some things the knowledge of which only belongs to God, and others which come within the range of our own knowledge, what ground is there for complaint if in regard to those things which we investigate in the scriptures, which are throughout spiritual, we are able by the grace of God to explain some of them, while we must leave others in the hands of God, and that not only in the present world, but also in that which is to come, so that God should forever teach and man should forever learn the things taught him by God. As the Apostle has said on this point, that when other things have been done away with, then these three, faith, hope, and charity, shall endure. 
for faith which has respect to our master endures unchangeably, assuring us that there is but one true God, and that we should truly love him forever, seeing that he alone is our Father, while we hope ever to be receiving more and more from God and to learn from him, because he is good and possesses boundless riches, a kingdom without end, and instruction that can never be exhausted. If, therefore, according to the rule which I have stated, we leave some questions in the hand of God, we shall both preserve our faith uninjured and shall continue without danger. And all scripture which has been given to us by God shall be found by us perfectly consistent, and the parables shall harmonize with those passages which are perfectly plain, and those statements, the meaning of which is clear, shall serve to explain the parables, and through the many diversified utterances of Scripture there shall be heard one harmonious melody in us, praising in hymns that God who created all things. If, for instance, anyone asks, What was God doing before he made the world? We reply that the answer to such a question lies with God himself. For that this world was formed perfect by God, receiving a beginning in time, the scriptures teach us. But no scripture reveals to us what God was employed about before this event. The answer, therefore, to that question remains with God. And it is not proper for us to aim at bringing forward foolish, rash, and blasphemous suppositions in reply to it. So as by one's imagining that he has discovered the origin of matter, he should in reality set aside God himself who made all things. For consider, all you who invent such opinions, since the Father himself is alone called God who has a real existence, but whom you style the Demiurge, since moreover the scriptures acknowledge him alone as God, and yet again, since the Lord confesses him alone as his own Father and knows no other, as I shall show from his very words, when you style this very being the fruit of defect and the offspring of ignorance and describe him as being ignorant of those things which are above him with the various other allegations which you make regarding him, consider the terrible blasphemy you are thus guilty of against him who is truly God. You seem to affirm gravely and honestly enough that you believe in God, but then, as you are utterly unable to reveal any other God, you declare this very being in whom you profess to believe the fruit of defect and the offspring of ignorance. Now, this blindness and foolish talking flow to you from the fact that you reserve nothing for God, but you wish to proclaim the nativity and production both of God himself, of his Enoya, of his Logos and life and Christ, and you form the idea of these from no other than a mere human experience, not understanding, as I said before, that it is possible in the case of man who is a compound being to speak in this way of the mind of man and the thought of man, and to say that thought, Enoia, springs from mind, census, intention, and themesis, again from thought and word, logos, from intention, but which logos? For there is among the Greeks one logos which is the principle that thinks, and another which is the instrument by means of which thought is expressed. And to say that a man sometimes is at rest and silent, while at other times he speaks and is active. But since God is all mind, all reason, all active spirit, all light, and always exists one and the same, as it is both beneficial for us to think of God, and as we learn regarding him from the scriptures, such feelings and divisions of operation cannot fittingly be ascribed to him. For our tongue, as being carnal, is not sufficient to minister to the rapidity of the human mind, inasmuch as that is of a spiritual nature, for that which reason our word is restrained within us, and not at once expressed, as it, it has been conceived by the mind, but is uttered by successive efforts, just as the tongue is able to serve it. But God being all mind and all logos speaks both exactly what he thinks and thinks exactly what he speaks, for his thought is logos, and logos is mind, and mind, comprehending all things, is the Father himself. 
He, therefore, who speaks of the mind of God and ascribes to it a special origin of its own, declares him a compound being, as if God were one thing and the original mind another. So again, with respect to Logos, when one attributes to him the third place of production from the Father, on which supposition he is ignorant of his greatness, and thus Logos has been far separated from God. As for one prophet, he declares respecting him, Who shall describe his generation? But you pretend to set forth his generation from the Father, and you transfer the production of the word of men, which takes place by means of a tongue, to the word of God, and thus are righteously exposed by your own selves of knowing neither things human nor divine. But beyond reason, inflate it with your own wisdom, you presumptuously maintain that you are acquainted with some unspeakable mysteries of God, while even the Lord, the very Son of God, allowed that the Father alone knows the very day and the hour of judgment, when he plainly declares, But of that day and that hour knows no man, neither the Son, but the Father only. If then the Son was not ashamed to ascribe the knowledge of that day to the Father only, but declared what was true regarding the matter, neither let us be ashamed to reserve for God those greater questions which may occur to us, for no man is superior to his master. If anyone therefore says to us, How then was the Son produced by the Father? We reply to him that no man understands that production, or generation, or calling, or revelation, or by whatever name one may describe his generation, which is in fact altogether indescribable. Neither Valentinus, nor Marcion, nor Saturninus, nor Basilides, nor angels, nor archangels, nor principalities, nor powers possess this knowledge, but the Father only who begot, and the Son who was begotten. Since, therefore, his generation is unspeakable, those who strive to set forth generations and productions cannot be in their right mind, inasmuch as they undertake to describe things which are indescribable. For that oh, a word is uttered at the bidding of a thought and mind all men indeed well understand. Those, therefore, who have excogitated the theory of emissions have not discovered anything great or revealed any abstruse mystery when they, they have simply transferred what all understands to the only begotten word of God. And while they style him unspeakable and unnameable, they nevertheless set forth the production and formation of his first generation as if they themselves had assisted at his birth and thus assimilating him to the word of mankind formed by emissions. But... We shall not be wrong if we affirm the same thing also concerning the substance of matter that God produced it. For we have learned from the scriptures that God holds the supremacy over all things. But whence or in what way he produced it, neither has scripture anywhere declared, nor does it become us to conjecture, so as, in accordance with our own opinions, to form endless conjectures concerning God, but we should leave such knowledge in the hands of God himself, in like manner also, we must leave the cause why, while all things were made by God, certain of his creatures sinned and revolted from a state of submission to God, and others, indeed the great majority, persevered, and do still persevere, in willing subjection to him who formed them, and also of what nature those are who sinned, and of what nature those who persevere. We must, I say, leave the cause of these things to God and his word, to whom alone he said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. But as for us, we still dwell upon the earth and have not yet sat down upon his throne. For although the spirit of the Savior, that is, in him, searches all things, even the deep things of God, yet as to us there are diversities of gifts differences of administrations and diversities of operations, and we, while upon the earth, as Paul also declares, know in part and prophecy in part. Since, therefore, we know but in part, we ought to leave all sorts of difficult questions in the hands of him who in some measure, and that only, bestows grace on us. That eternal fire, for instance, is prepared for sinners, both the Lord has plainly declared, and the rest of scriptures demonstrate, and that God foreknew that this would happen, 
The scriptures do in like manner demonstrate, since he prepared eternal fire from the beginning for those who were afterwards to transgress his commandments. But the cause itself of the nature of such transgressors neither has any scripture informed us, nor has an apostle told us, nor has the Lord taught us. It becomes us, therefore, to leave the knowledge of this matter to God, even as the Lord does of the day and hour of the judgment, and not to rush to such an extreme of danger that we will leave nothing in the hands of God. Even though we have received only a measure of grace from him in this world, but when we investigate points which are above us, and with respect to which we cannot reach satisfaction, it is absurd that we should display such an extreme of presumption as to lay open God and the things which are not yet discovered, as if already we had found out by the vain talk about emissions, God himself, the creator of all things, and to assert that he derived his substance from apostasy and ignorance, so as to frame an impious hypothesis in opposition to God. Moreover, they possess no proof of their system, which has but recently been invented by them, sometimes resting upon certain numbers, sometimes on syllables, and sometimes again on names, and there are occasions, too, when, by means of those letters which are contained in letters, by parables not properly interpreted, or by certain baseless conjectures, they strive to establish that fabulous account which they have devised. For if anyone should inquire the reason why the Father, who has fellowship with the Son in all things, has been declared by the Lord alone to know the hour and the day of judgment, he will find at present no more suitable or becoming or safe reason than this, since indeed the Lord is the only true master, that we may learn through him that the Father is above all things. For the Father, says he, is greater than I. The Father, therefore, has been declared by our Lord to excel with respect to knowledge. For this reason that we too, as long as we are connected with the scheme of things in this world, should leave perfect knowledge and such questions as have been mentioned to God, and should not by any chance, while we seek to investigate the sublime nature of the Father, fall into the danger of starting the question whether there is another God above God. But if any lover of strife contradict what I have said, and also what the Apostle affirms, that we know in part, and prophecy in part. And imagine that he has acquired not a partial, but a universal knowledge of all that exists, being such as one as Valentinus, or Ptolemaeus, or Basilides, or any of those who maintain that they have searched out the deep things of God. Let him not, arraying himself in vain glory, boast that he has acquired greater knowledge than others with respect to those which are invisible, and cannot be placed under our observation. But let him, by making diligent inquiry and obtaining information from the Father, tell us reasons which we know not of those things which are in this world, as, for instance, the number of the hairs on his own head, and the spares which are captured day by day, and such other points with which we are not previously acquainted, so that we may credit him also with respect to more important points. But if those who are perfect do not yet understand the very things in their hands and at their feet before their eyes and on the earth, and especially the rule followed respect to the hairs on their head, how can we believe them regarding things spiritual and supercelestial, and those which with a vain confidence they assert to be above God? So much then I have said concerning numbers and names and syllables and questions respecting such things as are above our comprehension and concerning their improper expositions of the parables. I add no more on these points, since you yourself may enlarge upon them. Get right with God and do it now. Get right with God and He will show you how. Kneel down at the cross where Jesus shed His 